This video is sponsored by my book, which is all about creativity and how I found mine again when I was hopelessly burned out. If you like this video, you will love my book. It says it all, as well as I know how to. It's called How to Write This Book, and it's my story of doing a creative act when I had no fuel in me to create. Click the link in my bio to purchase How to Write This Book, the tale of me renewing my creativity. The Sketch Hunter has delightful days of drifting about among people, in and out of the city, going anywhere, everywhere, stopping as long as he likes, no need to reach any point, moving in any direction, following the call of interests. He moves through life as he finds it, not passing negligently the things he loves, but stopping to know them. The development of the power of seeing and the power to retain in the memory that which is essential and to make record and thus test out how true the seeing and the memory have been is the way to happiness. There are moments in our lives, there are moments in a day when we seem to see beyond the usual, become clairvoyant. We reach then into reality. Such are the moments of our greatest happiness. Such are the moments of our greatest wisdom. It is in the nature of all people to have these experiences, but in our time, and under the conditions of our lives, it is only a rare few who are able to continue in the experience and find expression for it. At such times, there is a song going on within us, a song to which we listen. It fills us with surprise. We marvel at it. We would continue to hear it. But few are capable of holding themselves in the state of listening to their own song. Intellectuality steps in, and as the song within us is of the utmost sensitiveness, it retires in the presence of the cold, material intellect. It is aristocratic and will not associate itself with the commonplace, and we fall back and become our ordinary selves. Yet we live in the memory of these songs, which in moments of intellectual inadvertence have been possible to us. They are the pinnacles of our experience, and it is the desire to express these intimate sensations, this song from within, which motivates the masters of all art. Strokes carry a message whether you will it or not. The stroke is just like the artist at the time he makes it. All the certainties, all the uncertainties, all the bigness of his spirit, and all the littlenesses are in it. The real study of an art student is generally missed in the pursuit of a copying technique. I knew men who were students at the Académie Julien in Paris, where I studied in 1888, 13 years ago. I visited the Academy this year, 1901, and found some of the same students still there, repeating the same exercises and doing work nearly as good as they did 13 years ago. At almost any time in these 13 years, they have had technical ability enough to produce masterpieces. Many of them are more facile in their trade of copying the model, and they make fewer mistakes and imperfections of literal drawing and proportion than do some of the greatest masters of art. These students have become masters of the trade of drawing 
as some others have become masters of their grammars. And like so many of the latter, brilliant jugglers of words, having nothing worthwhile to say, they remain little else than clever jugglers of the brush. The real study of an art student is more a development of that sensitive nature and appreciative imagination with which he was so fully endowed when a child, and which, unfortunately, in almost all cases, the contact with the grown-ups shames out of him before he has passed into what is understood as real life. The art student that should be, and is so rare, is the one whose life is spent in the love and the culture of his personal sensations, the cherishing of his emotions, never undervaluing them, the pleasure of exclaiming them to others, and an eager search for their clearest expression. He never studies drawing because it will come in useful later when he is an artist. He has not time for that. He is an artist in the beginning and is busy finding the lines and forms to express the pleasures and emotions with which nature has already charged him. Oh, those long and dreary years of learning how to draw. How can a student, after the drudgery of it, look at a man or an antique statue with any other emotion than a plumb bob estimate of how many lengths of head he has? One's early fancy of man and things must not be forgot. One's appreciation of them is too much sullied by coldly calculating and dissecting them. One's fancy must not be put aside, but the excitement and the development of it must be continued through the work. From the antique cast, there should be no work done if it is not to translate your impression of the beauty the sculptor has expressed. To go before the cast or the living model without having them suggest to you a theme and to sit there and draw without a theme for hours is to begin the hardening of your sensibilities to them, the loss of your power to take pleasure in them. The reproduction of things is but the idle industry of one who does not value his sensations, and who was done with his imaginings when he passed out of childhood and consented that the prancing horse he had bestrode in those happy days had only been a broken broomstick. One of the great difficulties of an art student is to decide between his own natural impressions and what he thinks should be his impressions. When the majority of students and the majority of so-called arrived artists go out into landscape, saying they intend to look for a motive, they too often mean, unconsciously enough, that it is their intention to look until they have found an arrangement in the landscape, most like some one of the pictures they have seen and liked in the galleries. A hundred times, perhaps, they have walked by their own subject, felt it, enjoyed it, but having no estimate of their own personal sensations, lacking faith in themselves, pass on until they come to this established taste of another. And here they would be ashamed if they did not appreciate, for this is an approved taste. And they try to adopt it because it is what they think they should like, whether they really do so or not. Is it not fine to see the development of oneself, the finding of one's own tastes, the final selection of a most favorite theme, the concentration 
of all one's forces on that theme, its development, the constant effort to find its clearest expression in the chosen medium, an effort of expression which commenced with the beginning of the idea and follows its progress step by step, becoming a technique born of the theme itself and special to it. The continuation through years, new elements entering as life goes on, each step differing, yet all the same, a simple theme on which a life is strung. The study of art should go broadcast. Every individual should study his own individuality to the end of knowing his tastes, should cultivate the pleasures so discovered and find the most direct means of expressing those pleasures to others, thereby enjoying them over again. Art, after all, is but an extension of language to the expression of sensations too subtle for words. And we will acquire this greater power of revealing ourselves. All the forms of art are to be a common language, and the artist will no longer distinguish himself by his tricks of painting, but must take rank only by the weight and beauty of what he expresses with the wise use of the languages of art universally known. It is harder to see than it is to express. A genius is one who can see. The others can often draw remarkably well. Their kind of drawing, however, is not very difficult. They can change about. They can make their sight fit the easiest way for their drawing. As their seeing is not particular, it does not matter. With the seer, it is different. Nothing will do but the most precise statement. He must not only bend technique to his will, but he must invent technique that will specially fit his need. He is not one who floats affably in his culture. He is the blazer of the road for what he has to bring. Those who get their technique first, expecting sight to come to them later, get a technique of a very ready-made order. To study technique means to make it, to invent it, to take the raw material each time anew and twist it into shape. It must be made to serve a specific purpose. The same technique must never be used again. Each time it must be made new and fresh. A stock set of phrases won't do. The study is a development of wit. An artist's warehouse, full of experience, is not a store of successful phrases ready for use, but is a store of raw material. The successful phrases are there, but they've been broken down to be made over into new form. Those who have the will to create do not care to use old phrases. There's a great pleasure in the effort to invent the exact thing which is needed. Use it, break it down, begin again. It is a great thing to be able to see. I have been trying to make this matter clear, this matter that the whole fun of the thing is in seeing and inventing, trying to refute a common idea that education is a case of collecting and storing instead of making. It's not easy, but the matter is mighty well worth considering. There are pictures that manifest education, and there are pictures that manifest love. All outward success when it has value, is but the inevitable result 
of an inward success, of full living, full play, and enjoyment of one's faculties. When the motives of artists are profound, when they are at their work as a result of deep consideration, when they believe in the importance of what they are doing, their work creates a stir in the world. I have just laid down a book, and the caress of my hand was for the man who wrote it, for the great human sympathy of the man and his revealing gift to me through the book. I have never seen the man, do not know his outside, but I am intimately acquainted with him. His warmth is all about me. In so far as I am capable, I am his kin. I am not anxious to see how well he dances or how well he paints. He has said what he wanted to say to me in the way he wanted and thought best to say it. I do not like the very modern fancy which makes an actor of a man as soon as he has proven himself a pugilist. It is true, no doubt, that if my writer is deflected from writing to dancing or painting, somewhat of his genius will appear in these arts. But why should he be deflected, since it is the man's self we want, and he has found and developed his best way of giving it? There are many ways of seeing things. When you saw the thing, and it looked beautiful to you, you saw it beautifully. Paint it as it looked then. However long studied, it still will be a little technique, the measure of the man. The greatness of art depends absolutely on the greatness of the artist's individuality, and on the same source depends the power to acquire a technique sufficient for expression. The man who is forever acquiring technique with the idea that sometime he may have something to express, will never have the technique of the thing he wishes to express. It is more the gesture of a feature than the feature itself which interests and pleases us. The feature is the outside. Its gesture manifests the inner life. Develop your visual memory. Draw everything you have drawn from the model from memory as well. Realize that a drawing is not a copy. It is a construction in very different material. A drawing is an invention. Yet more important than the lifelong study of technique is the lifelong self education. In fact, technique can only be used properly by those who have definite purpose in what they do, and it is only they who invent technique. Otherwise, it is the work of parrots. You can do anything you want to. What is rare is this actual wanting to do a specific thing. Wanting it so much that you're practically blind to all other things, that nothing else will satisfy you. When you, body and soul, wish to make a certain expression and cannot be distracted from this one desire, then you will be able to make a great use of whatever technical knowledge you have. You will have clairvoyance. You will see the uses of the technique you already have and you will invent more. I know I have said a lot when I say you can do anything you want to do, but I mean it. There is reason for you to give this statement some of your best thought. You may find that this is just what is the matter with most of the people in the world, that few are really wanting what they think they want, 
and that most people go through their lives without ever doing one whole thing they really want to do. An artist has got to get acquainted with himself just as much as he can. It is no easy job, for it is not a present-day habit of humanity. This is what I call self-development, self-education. No matter how fine a school you are in, you have to educate yourself. There's nothing more entertaining than to have a frank talk with yourself, if you do it frankly. Educating yourself is getting acquainted with yourself. Find out what you really like, if you can. Find out what is really important to you. Then sing your song. You will have something to sing about, and your whole heart will be in the singing. When a man is full up with what he is talking about, he handles such language as he has with a mastery unusual to him. And it is at such times that he learns language. Mm -hmm.